नमस्कार दिस इज फर्स्ट पोस्ट न्यू वॉचिंग वैंटेज विद मी पलकी शर्मा Our India and China normalizing ties. We've been tracking key meetings, statements and policy decisions and they all indicate a shift. Tonight we'll tell you what has changed and whether a resolution to the border dispute is finally in sight. In the US a heated debate over the presidential debate, was it biased? Did the moderators help and favor Kamala Harris? We'll tell you who said what and why. In Pakistan they're celebrating a new hero, a policeman who killed a blasphemy accused in custody. In China, auditor Price Waterhouse Cooper of PwC has been banned for 6 months for helping property giant Evergrande cook its books. In North Korea, Kim Jong Un has been photographed in a nuclear facility. What's the message they're trying to send? The story of the fall of Boeing, classic Murphy's law, everything that can go wrong is going wrong there. How an Indian chef has busted a western stereotype and won the internet. why the uk prime minister has said the national health service must reform or die and why scientists say your gut is your second brain all this and more coming up the headlines first us president joe biden meets the uk's prime minister keir starmer in washington the two leaders discuss the ukraine war also mull whether to let kiev fire western supplied missiles into russia moscow has warned that such a move will mean nato is at war with russia Ukrainian president Zelensky says he will meet Biden this month with his victory plan. India renames Port Blair, the capital of Andaman and Nicobar Islands will now be called Sri Vijayapuram. Home Minister Amit Shah announces this decision says it is to free the nation from the colonial imprints. The city was earlier named after a British official of the East India Company. And staying with India, Delhi Chief Minister Arvind Kejriwal walks out of jail assures his supporters that prison has not broken his morale earlier today kejriwal was wal was gra- granted bail by the supreme court of india he was arrested in march in connection with the now scrapped excise policy case south african president cyril ramaphosa signs a contested education bill into law but delays implementing clauses which could fracture his unity government the second largest party in his government has now threatened to move court this is the first major test for the ruling coalition which was formed after the may election China to raise its retirement age after decades for men it will now be extended to 63 years from 60 for women it will be 58 years instead of 55 the decision comes amid a looming demographic crisis and an aging population China's current retirement age is among the lowest in the world Cristiano Ronaldo creates history this time off the field. The footballer now has 1 billion followers across all social media platforms. Ronaldo is the first person to achieve this milestone. It comes just days after he became the first footballer to score 900 career goals. India has a China problem. Two weeks ago, Foreign Minister Jay Shankar said this. Tonight, we ask if we are close to solving that problem. It's a rhetorical question, but worth asking because there are rumblings of a rapprochement. Thanks to two events in the past 24 hours, earlier today, key officials from India and China met in Russia. in St Petersburg the border czars from both sides national security adviser ajit doval from india and foreign minister wang yi from china both were in russia for a brics event they had a meeting on the sidelines to discuss the border standoff and it seems that they had a good meeting india and china released separate statements both hinted at a possible resolution india statement called for disengagement with and i'm quoting urgency what about the chinese They did not specifically mention the border but they said China wants and I'm quoting again China wants an improvement of bilateral relations 
So that's the first development. The second happened yesterday when India's Foreign Minister S. Jay Shankar spoke about the border. He too said that progress is being made. Negotiations are going on. We made some progress. Uh, I would say roughly, you can say about 75% of the disengagement problems are sorted out. We still have some, some things to do. 75% sorted out, he says. Jay Shankar was a bit vague in that statement, but there's a pattern that is emerging. Take a look at this report. India and China are looking to resume direct flights. Yesterday, India's civil aviation minister met with Chinese officials, and on the agenda was the resumption of direct flights. India blocked them in 2020, soon after the pandemic. Before that, more than 500 direct flights operated between India and China every month. The pandemic brought air travel to a halt. It was supposed to be a temporary halt, but the border standoff made the ban permanent. China has been urging India to lift these curbs, and so far New Delhi has refused. But after this meeting, the decision is awaited. I'm sure it will depend on how the border talks shape up. The other sticking point has been trade ties. India has not been able to wean its economy off China, but in the last few years, Chinese investments have been under scrutiny. Now, New Delhi has started approving Chinese investment proposals. Last month, at least five projects got a green light. These were in the electronics manufacturing sector. Business visas are also being fast-tracked. For Chinese engineers and technicians, India has tweaked its visa policy for them. And when it comes to imports, China remains India's top trading partner. Now, let's join these dots. A pitch to resume direct flights, a nod to fresh Chinese investments, faster visas and more imports. What does all of this tell you? India is easing restrictions for China and that too on multiple fronts. So this could be a quiet shift to create the right conditions to solve the border standoff. But is there progress on that front? What is the current situation on the border, the India-China border? There are two flashpoints in eastern Ladakh, Depsang and Demchok. De-escalation and disengagement here is critical to ending the standoff. But there's a bigger worry too. The militarization of the India-China border, it stretches over 3,000 kilometers. It is called the line of actual control. That's the de facto border, the line of actual control. It is not demarcated. And as of today, troops are stationed on both sides of this border. We are talking about 50 to 60,000 troops on each side. The longer they remain near the border, the higher the risk of a military clash. Until both sides pull back troops, the relationship cannot normalize. And it is in China's interest to come to the talking table sincerely now. Their economy is hurting. Keeping a large border force is costly. The West and Western trade barriers are bleeding China, so they need to restore ties with India. New Delhi may be looking to offer economic incentives and asking for a border deal in return. No one has spelled it out officially in so many words, but this could be the thinking behind some of the recent decisions. It is a bold bet, we say. New Delhi must tread cautiously because China remains a slippery customer. It continues to hurt India's strategic interests. Look at this latest report. China is arming Pakistan, helping them with their ballistic missile program. This is according to the United States. The U.S. has announced, announced fresh sanctions today, targeting a Chinese research institute and several companies, the one supplying missile technology to Pakistan. Irrespective, India is looking to resolve the standoff with minimum collateral damage. There is growing talk of a meeting between Prime Minister Modi and President Xi Jinping. This could happen next month in Russia where both leaders are expected to attend the BRICS summit. Resolving the border dispute could pave the way for these talks. Not the first time India is making a sincere effort. And knowing China, it may not be the last time either. The next few weeks will be critical. We'll be tracking this one for you. There will be no third debate. Now let's look at the U.S., where the rumor mill is a buzz. There are allegations of a conspiracy of a plot against Donald Trump. 
On Tuesday, Trump took part in a presidential debate. He faced off against Kamala Harris. Some of you would have seen the debate. We told you about it. What did you think of it? Who do you think won the debate? Donald Trump believes it was him that he won the debate hands down. So because we've done two debates and because they were successful, there will be no third debate. Trump says there will be no third debate. His first debate was against Joe Biden. It forced the sitting U.S. president to withdraw from the race. The second debate was against Kamala Harris, and Trump thinks that he won it. In fact, he says that it may have been his best debate, so he doesn't want another one. On the other side, there's Kamala Harris. She's quite eager for another round. So North Carolina, two nights ago, Donald Trump and I had our debate. In this election, what's at stake could not be more important. Harris wants to debate Trump again. She says they owe it to American voters. Trump does not agree, and he is turning Harris's enthusiasm against her. But she immediately called for a second debate, which means that she was like a prize fighter that lost a fight. Trump elaborated further on his social media platform, Truth Social. He says that Harris's demand for a rematch shows that she lost. He's been saying this ever since the debate ended, saying that he won and that there was no point in having a rematch. But even though he claims to have won, he's still upset about how the debate was handled. The debate was hosted by ABC. It's an American TV network. Trump is quite upset with this network and its anchors. The debate was moderated by two ABC anchors and they were constantly fact-checking Donald Trump, disputing his claims during the debate. Trump and the Republicans say that this was biased because the anchors did not fact-check Kamala Harris. They say it was a plot to try and derail Trump. As this controversy was brewing, a new rumor has emerged. It has been alleged that ABC gave Kamala Harris the debate questions beforehand. Where did the rumor start? On social media. This account said that it was in touch with a whistleblower from ABC. The whistleblower apparently signed an affidavit saying that Harris was given sample questions, which were essentially the same as the final questions at the debate. Apparently, she was also assured that she would not be fact-checked. So this social media post started the rumor, and it was picked up by other outlets and eventually amplified by billionaire hedge fund managers who support Donald Trump and Trump himself. He seems to believe the rumor, calling it very likely and that it should be investigated. As they say, social media has a life of its own. ABC has denied the accusations and any investigation wouldn't get concluded before the election anyway, so it's unlikely we'll ever get to the bottom of this. But does it really matter? All of this seems quite childish, to be fair. Both Trump and Harris claiming that they won the debate, Harris wanting another to rub it in, Trump refusing and insulting the referees, and then the Democrats calling Trump chicken. I'm not making this up. That's Kamala Harris's campaign manager actually calling Donald Trump a chicken. This is the state of American politics. This is what it has devolved into, name-calling and blaming moderators. The truth is, whatever the debate result, it has not changed much on the ground. No side got a boost in the polls. They're still neck and neck. The election will go down to the wire and another debate probably won't change that. Our next story is from Pakistan. A murder has taken place in the country in the city of Quetta. It took place inside a police station. The murderer was a police constable. He shot a man who was in custody. Why? Because the victim was accused of committing blasphemy. The victim's name was Abdul Ali. He had been arrested on Wednesday after a video of his went viral. He allegedly said something objectionable about the Prophet Muhammad. So he was charged under Pakistan's draconian blasphemy law. That sounds absurd enough as it is. A country having a blasphemy law in this day and age. But the story just keeps getting worse. Even though the accused was arrested, it wasn't enough for some people. 
Members of some religious political parties took to the streets. They took out rallies, blocked traffic, burned tires and created a ruckus. Then the mob gathered outside the police station holding the victim. They demanded that he be handed over. The police refused. So the mob threw a hand grenade at the police station. Now what would the police do in a normal country? They would arrest the lunatics, chucking hand grenades. But this is Pakistan, where a deranged mob can easily overpower law enforcement. So the police pleaded with the mob. They gave assurances to the political party in charge. They told them that the accused had been booked and an investigation was underway. The pleading worked. The mob went away to cause chaos elsewhere. Meanwhile, the Quetta police decided to move the accused to a different police station in case the mob got bored and decided to return. And even this wasn't enough to save Abdul Ali. On Thursday, he got a visit from Saad Khan Sarhadi, a constable from the first police station. This constable made his way to Ali's new holding cell and shot him dead. This means a police official murdered a blasphemy suspect who was already in custody. The constable has been arrested, but some people are calling him a hero. People are going to his house to congratulate his father, apparently for raising a murderer of the defenseless. This event is reportedly the first of its kind in Quetta, but not in Pakistan, because this country sees incidents like this far too often. In the month of June, a man was lynched in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa allegedly for desecrating the Quran. Just days before that, a man was killed over blasphemy accusations. He was 73 years old, 73. A mob beat him up. He later died because of his injuries. Blasphemy is a rallying cry for Pakistan's extremists. It has become an excuse for people to take the law into their own hands. And this psychotic behavior is encouraged by Pakistani establishment, the government, as it refuses to do anything about the country's blasphemy laws. These laws were inherited from the British, but Pakistan made them more severe in the 1980s, during the reign of the military dictator Mohammad Ziaul Haq. Zia was a religious hardliner, and he wanted the country to reflect his worldview. Up till 1986, there were 14 cases related to blasphemy in Pakistan. After Zia mucked about, there have been hundreds. The military dictator popularized the prosecution of blasphemy. And this has made its way down to the people, brainwashing them and creating the conditions for mob lynchings. No Pakistani politician will reverse Zia's, cha Zia's changes for two reasons. One, they're scared of the mob, terrified of the monster they helped create because even politicians get murdered when it comes to blasphemy in Pakistan. And the second reason is greed. The blasphemy law has helped birth extremist movements and religious political parties. These parties can rally popular support, as we just saw in the case of Quetta. The support can be converted into votes. That's why no Pakistani politician will ever try and repeal the blasphemy laws. Now take a step back and think about everything that you just heard. About how religion has been weaponized, about how cynically it has been used. What is the real purpose of blasphemy laws? To protect religion? Religion has been, has been there, has been around long before any of us. And it will be here long after we are gone. It does not need protecting. Blasphemy laws are not about protecting religion. They are about persecution. These are tools to control the masses and an easy way for politicians to remain in power. The people of Pakistan should recognize this and push for a reform before more lives are lost. China's property crisis has claimed another victim. This time, it is one of the biggest auditors in the world, PricewaterhouseCoopers, better known as PwC. They face a six-month ban in China and have to pay a fine of $62 million. This is the largest penalty China has ever imposed on an auditor. So why is PwC being punished? This case is about Evergrande. It used to be China's biggest property developer. The company went bust earlier this year. China says Evergrande committed fraud and PwC helped them cover it up. PwC audited the books of Evergrande. Beijing says there were clear signs of fraud. But PwC chose to, and I'm quoting, they chose to turn a blind eye to them. It made, and I'm quoting again, material misstatements in the financial statements. 
That's what Chinese investigators have concluded. But what does that even mean? Let me explain. Evergrande was China's biggest property developer. It had over, over 1,300 projects across 280 cities. That's how big this company was. At its peak, Evergrande borrowed heavily to expand. It amassed a debt of more than $300 billion. It became the world's most indebted property developer, $300 billion. This giant mountain of debt became too much to handle for them. When sales dried up, revenues began to shrink. In 2021, Evergrande missed a payment deadline. It defaulted on its debt and from there, it all went downhill. The property developer collapsed. Evergrande used to be the crown jewel of China's real estate boom. Today, it is a symbol of China's property crisis. But what role did PwC play in all of this, in this mess? PwC audited the financial statements of Evergrande. Just like an impartial referee in a football match, the auditor's job was to make sure that Evergrande followed all the rules, that it reported its financial details with accuracy. If there were mistakes or fouls, PwC was supposed to have blown the whistle. But it did not. Evergrande boosted sales by misrepresenting numbers. Reports say it... it it exaggerated revenue by a whopping $78 billion. It took money from home buyers and showed this cash as revenue on the books without even building the apartments. This wasn't an accounting mistake. This was Evergrande cooking its books and PwC signed off on those balance sheets. This is outright cheating. It affected everyone who did business with Evergrande. Banks who extended loans to the developer, investigators who bought Evergrande shares, and even home buyers and contractors, they all believed that the builder was financially stable. But they were fooled by the facade that PwC helped create. So now the auditor must face the music. In 2022, PwC was China's top auditor. Today, it has been slapped with a six-month ban. Needless to say, its business has taken a hit. More than 30 companies in China have dropped PwC as their auditor. These companies are listed on Chinese exchanges. Meanwhile, PwC has admitted that it made a mistake. It has issued an apology and sacked six of its partners. But the ban will cause far greater damage. It hurts PwC's credibility, and that's everything for an auditor. PwC was among what is called the Big Four, the world's four biggest auditing firms. The other three are Ernst & Young. ENY, Deloitte, and KPMG. But we must add here that PwC is not the only one to blame for this mess. It's an easy target. What were the Chinese regulators doing? Where were they when Evergrande was on a borrowing spree? In 2019, the company was worth over $30 billion. That was Evergrande's market capitalization. It remained above $30 billion for the most part of 2019. Do you know how much debt it was under at that point, more than $100 billion. That's more than thrice the market cap. You don't need an accountant to tell you that this is problematic. Such levels of debt are unsustainable. China could have sounded the alarm back then, but it did not. For years, Chinese regulators tolerated this borrowing spree. They assumed that the bubble will not burst, but it did. And now instead of fixing the debt issues, China is looking for scapegoats. That's what PwC really is, a scapegoat. When it rains, it pours. Stands true for Boeing. The aviation company is dealing with a lot. There's a lawsuit, million dollar fines for crashes, whistleblower deaths, faulty planes, financial losses. Name any problem and it's likely that Boeing is going through it. And amid all this, 30,000 of its workers are going on strike. They haven't had a pay hike in 16 years, and they won't return until their demands are met. Last time a strike like this happened was, was in 2008. Boeing lost almost $1.5 billion then. What will it look like this time? And is the company equipped to handle such a loss? Our next report tells you. The clock struck midnight, and down went the tools. 30,000 Boeing workers will not pick them up anytime soon. They are on a strike. A walkout that could cost the company billions. But it's been coming for some time now. 
This will be an unfair labor practice strike as there were many violations of the law while on the shop floor. We had discriminatory conduct, we had coercive questioning, we had unlawful surveillance, and we had unlawful promise of benefits. The last time Boeing workers went on a strike was in 2008. It was for eight weeks. It cost the company about $1.5 billion. Finally, the company and workers reached a deal. That same contract continues today. Of course, it was high time for an upgrade, so the union and the company sat down to work out a new deal. The initial demand was a 40% pay rise, but Boeing gave a tentative proposal for a 25% pay hike. The union called it the best negotiated contract. It urged workers to accept the deal, but the workers did not care for it. The whole contract's unfair. They're taking too much away from us without giving us anything. 25% raise is a load of crap. We haven't had a raise in 16 years. It just feels like they're trying to put a little bit of pressure on us. And that's just not the way you want to act towards your employees if you really want us to work for you and build a quality plane. So workers in Seattle and Portland voted. 94.6% voted against the agreement. 96% voted in favor of a strike, which is why they've now put down their tools and are not coming back until Boeing decides to bargain in good faith. Now, this is really bad news for Boeing CEO Kelly Ortberg. He's been in the office for just five weeks and now he has to deal with a full-blown strike. What does this mean for Boeing? Well, the company was once the gold standard of aviation. But two crashes, multiple accidents, mysterious whistleblower deaths and zero accountability later, the company's reputation is in the doldrums. Flying a Boeing was once a matter of pride. Now it's a dangerous game. This has also affected the company's finances. In July, Boeing had to plead guilty in a case involving two fatal crashes of its 737 MAX planes. It faces a criminal fine of nearly $244 million. There are other lawsuits too, after a door blew out mid-air in an Alaska Airlines flight. On top of all this, there's a product cap. It was set by the US Federal Aviation Administration. It says that Boeing cannot produce unlimited 737 MAX planes. A strike will just make things worse. Production of the company's best-selling planes will come to a screeching halt. Since 2019, Boeing hasn't recorded a profitable quarter, and by the looks of it, it isn't happening anytime soon. So what can the company do? Well, the logical solution right now is a quick settlement, and it does seem possible. Boeing looks prepared to return to the table. But will the workers be willing to do the same? Well, we'll find out in the coming weeks. Either way, there's turbulence ahead for Boeing. Our next story is about North Korea. The Hermit Kingdom is known for a lot of things, but what stands out is its secrecy. Pyongyang is, is extremely hush-hush. No one really knows what's going on over there, which is why a set of new photos has captured the world's imagination. These were released by North Korea. You can see them here. They show Kim Jong-un in a nuclear facility. That's the North Korean leader. He's touring the facility. He's seen walking beside centrifuges, metal centrifuges. Of course, this is a photo op. But for once, it is not Kim who is in focus. What, it's what's behind him that's more crucial. It's a uranium enrichment facility. It produces highly enriched uranium. And what do you do with it? You make nuclear warheads with enriched uranium. So essentially, this is a nuclear facility, and it's unclear where it is located or when Kim visited it. But the disclosure is no coincidence. It sends a clear message. North Korea is telling the world that it is making nukes. Its nuclear ambitions are alive, and they're growing. But how did they get here? How did North Korea acquire nukes? What is its current position? And what does this photo op indicate? The story begins in the 1960s during the Cold War. North Korea was close to the Soviet Union. They were allies. North Korea had already founded a nuclear program. 
but it did not make much progress. So the Soviets came to their rescue. They transferred nuclear technology, they helped train scientists, they even helped Pyongyang build a reactor. Even at that time, North Korea had bigger ambitions. Then leader Kim Il-sung wanted nukes. In the 1970s, North Korea obtained a Soviet-era missile. They got it from Egypt. So Pyongyang reverse engineered it and it created two missiles. These were crude in design, but they gave North Korea a lot of confidence. It ramped up its nuclear testing while saber rattling with the West continued. Then the Soviet Union fell. In 1994, Jimmy Carter visited Pyongyang. Of course, it was historic. He was a former U.S. president and the first leader of, of this stature to set foot in North Korea. Carter spoke to Kim Il-sung for two days. Finally, they reached a deal. North Korea would freeze its nuclear program. In exchange, America would res resume dialogue with them, with Pyongyang. They signed the agreed framework. It lasted for a few years. But in the year 2002, it all fell apart. And in 2006, North Korea conducted its first successful nuclear test. And since then, there is no stopping them. Pyongyang has held multiple tests, including testing the patience of its neighbors. It has raised the nuclear ante and amassed weapons. The U.S. believes North Korea possesses nuclear warheads, almost 60 of them. But it could be more, the number. Which brings us to the next question. Why does North Korea need nuclear weapons? Well, they see it as an insurance policy. I mean, look at North Korea. It's a small country, isolated country, surrounded by Japan and South Korea and at loggerheads with the United States. So they see nukes as a shield. The arsenal serves as a great equalizer, not just tools of deterrence, but a guarantee of the, of the regime's survival. For the Kim dynasty, nukes are key to ensuring they control the country, their control over North Korea. They don't see them as bargaining chips. They see them as the key to North Korea's independence. So if they've always had nukes and are creating more weapons, why the photo op now? Well, the answer lies in an election which is being held thousands of kilometers away. America is going to polls in a couple of months. So this could be a warning from Pyongyang. A signal that no matter who becomes president, North Korea will still have nukes. Pyongyang is cementing its position as a nuclear power and that puts the ball in Washington's court. Will the next president engage in a nuclear standoff or will diplomacy finally prevail? As they say, only time will tell. There's a modern saying, I'm sure you've all heard it, it goes, the internet is forever. That's the saying. What this means is that once something is on the internet, it will stay there forever, always ready to come back to life. And this has just happened with a video featuring Vikas Khanna, who's a celebrity chef based in New York, and he's going viral again because of an interview from the year 2020 during the peak of the Wuhan virus pandemic. You remember those bleak days. The world was under lockdown. People couldn't leave their homes. Incomes and savings were drying up, and ordinary people were going hungry. Vikas Khanna was among those who tried to help. He started an initiative called Feed India. From the U.S., he coordinated a massive meal drive to help the needy in India. The initiative was lauded. It gained global attention, including from the BBC. They asked him for an interview, and that interview went viral because of the following interaction. You've cooked for the Obamas. You've been on TV show with Gordon Ramsay. But it was not always that way, was it? You are not from a rich family. So, I dare say, you understand how precarious it can be in India. The interviewer made that statement. It's a standard, casual, run-of-the-mill racism. He just randomly perpetuated some stereotypes about India. Khanna was not born a billionaire, so then he must have understood hunger. He is from India after all. Khanna didn't miss a beat, though. He responded with this. I understand, but my sense of hunger didn't come from India so much, because I was born and raised in Amritsar. And we have a huge community kitchen where everyone gets fed. The entire city can eat there. But my sense of hunger came from New York. That was the reply and it has gone viral four years after he said it. Why has it caught the public imagination once again? Well, look at these social media posts. You'll notice the pattern. It shows that Indians are fed up with Western arrogance, with the absurd stereotypes. And this keeps happening. In 2014, 
It was this cartoon by the New York Times. They put this up when India was planning a mission to Mars. The cartoon went viral again last year after the Chandrayaan-3 mission. When India became the first country to successfully soft land a spacecraft on the moon's south pole. Last year, we saw this as well. A cartoon put up by a German publication, Der Spiegel. It was when India overtook China to become the world's most populous country. Look at how the German publication chose to depict India. Again, blatantly racist. Like I said, this keeps happening. Time and again, the West keeps insulting countries like India. Vikas Khanna's response not only defended India well, he also said that his experience with hunger came from New York, highlighting the fact that most of the West likes to overlook. Millions of Americans experience food insecurity, including over 13 million children. Their families struggle to put th three meals on the table. But you won't see a British journalist say, you're not from a rich family, so I dare say you understand how precarious it is to be in the US. That will never happen. The Western media likes to pretend that everything is fine at home, that the real problems are all elsewhere, and that anyone born outside the West must have, must have barely survived starvation. It's an absurd stereotype rooted in racism, and Vikas Khanna's response called it out. That's why it's being celebrated four years after he said it, and it will probably go viral again in the future. Reform or die, that's what the UK's Prime Minister Keir Starmer has told the NHS. NHS is the UK's National Health Service. It has been in a really bad shape for years now. This week, a damning report came out. It laid bare the critical state of NHS from the crumbling infrastructure to the ballooning wait list, which stands at 7.6 million. That's how many people are waiting for health care in the UK. So Starmer has come up with an ambitious but controversial idea. He has promised a 10-year plan. He says money will not solve the problems. What the NHS needs is a complete reform. But can this decade-long plan resuscitate the National Health Service? Here's a report. The NHS is in a critical condition. We aren't saying this. A damning report is. NHS is the UK's National Health Service. It has been in crisis mode for years now. But now it faces its worst crisis ever. A government-commissioned independent review was held, led by independent peer and NHS surgeon Ara Darzi. The report's findings have shocked the nation. Darzi says that NHS is in, quote-unquote, serious trouble. The productivity is declining. There are cancellations of more hospital treatments than any comparable country. The waiting list is ballooning. It currently stands at 7.6 million. Last year, more than 100,000 infants waited more than six hours before they were treated. This year, nearly a tenth of all patients are now waiting for 12 hours or more. Darzi says the NHS emergency services are in an awful state. The infrastructure is crumbling. Patients with long-term physical ailments like diabetes and respiratory problems are not getting the help they need. Meanwhile, patients with mental health problems are left in, and we quote again, Victorian-era cells infested with vermin. So the NHS, instead of healing people, is causing about 14,000 more deaths every year. Like we said, this is a damning report. And British Prime Minister Keir Starmer shares his country's shock. Until this morning, we didn't know the full scale of the damage which is laid bare in the report. Even Lord Darcy, with all his years of experience, is shocked by what is discovered. It is unforgivable. And people have every right to be angry. So what is Starmer's solution? Well, no more funding. The irony is almost painful. But the Prime Minister says that the NHS's problems will not be solved by more money. The NHS needs reform. Starmer says the NHS can reform or die. So what is he going to do? He has promised to draw up a 10-year plan. He calls it the biggest reimagining of the NHS. This reimagining will only appear in spring next year. So the details are not clear yet. But it will focus on three key areas. First, the transition to a digital NHS. Secondly, moving more care from hospitals to communities. And thirdly, focusing efforts on prevention over sickness. 
Now, this plan is highly controversial. Yes, the NHS needs to be transformed completely. Yes, this will take time. But right now, the NHS also needs urgent help. Critics say that small changes over a decade may invite the slow death of the NHS. Yet Starmer remains hopeful. The NHS may be broken, but it's not beaten. As the report says, the NHS may be in a critical condition, but its vital signs are strong. And we need to have the courage to deliver long-term reform. Major surgery, not sticking plasters. The surgery carries major risks. Will it do more harm than good? Well, as the cliché goes, only time will tell. But by then, the NHS may have no choice between reform or death. Have you ever heard of top-down diseases? They start in the brain, then percolate down to the gut. Parkinson's has long been considered one of them, a top-down disease. Parkinson's is a neurological disorder. It causes stiff muscles and involuntary tremors or shaking. This is a disorder of the nervous system, of the brain. But here's a lesser known fact. Parkinson's patients face digestive issues as well, like stomach ulcers, difficulty in swallowing, or irrit irritable bowels. Treatments can reduce the symptoms, but the brain and the stomach, both of the brain and the stomach, but there is no cure for the disease. Today, it is the fastest growing neurological disorder the world over. The numbers have doubled in the past 25 years. 10 million people suffer from it. Experts are calling it the Parkinson pandemic. So scientists are scrambling to find answers. But research shows that first, they have a lot to uh, unlearn. Parkinson's does not have a cure yet because for years research has been upside down. Parkinson's may not be a top-down disease after all. It could be a bottom-up issue where it starts in the gut then goes all the way to the brain. That's what recent studies show, a bottom-up map of the Parkinson's disease. And the evidence is only growing. A new study is adding to this. It says that Parkinson's disease begins in the stomach and if people have gut problems, this could be an early warning sign. Doctors have a gut feeling that this may be true. They don't have all the answers yet, but what they do know, based on decades of research, is this. We have two brains, each one of us. We have a brain in the head and one in the gut, and they're connected. And if this sounds like crazy talk, let me ask you, have you ever felt butterflies in your stomach, that tingling feeling, maybe right before an exam or before giving a speech? This was the work of your dual nervous system. When your brain was nervous, so was your gut. And by gut, we don't mean just one thing. We're referring to the entire digestive system. You may remember this from your school, science homework in school. So trauma flashback warning. But think of it as a passageway. It includes your mouth, your throat, the esophagus, stomach, small and large intestine, and rectum. This system manages everything that you eat, and it has a brain of its own, quite literally. Much like your brain, your digestive tract has nerve cells, millions of them. They form neural networks to communicate with each other. Our brain uses the network to control our behavior, so our gut brain does the same thing. It has an entire library filled with records of behavioral programs. When you eat something, your gut library gets into action and calls up a program. So when you eat junk food, you feel more tired. Versus when you eat spinach, for example, you will feel more alert. Try it. The second brain is very well connected to your big brain up there. So your gut lies at the heart of many diseases. You already know that what you eat affects your physical health. You know that. But it's also linked to your psychiatric health. People with gut problems are at high risk of developing anxiety, depression, dementia, Alzheimer's, and Parkinson's disease. So it is a no-brainer that we have to take care of our second brain, which is our gut. Despite what social media tells you, there is no shortcut to this. Eating better is the best time-tested approach, like fruits, vegetables, whole grains, nuts, and poultry. Research shows that people eating a Mediterranean diet have a 23% lower risk of developing dementia and 53% for Alzheimer's. Call this a pre-weekend mantra. So go with your gut and protect it, because it will protect your brain.
Our next story is about today's date, Friday the 13th. It was once the stuff of nightmares, a date etched in superstition, shrouded in fear and whispered about in hushed tones. People acted like the world was going to end on this day. They cancelled travel plans, delayed the birth of children and avoided black cats like a plague. Well, not anymore. Friday the 13th is a victim of the ultimate horror story. It has become a meme. After all, it's hard to be afraid of bad luck when your feed is full of dancing black cats. Guess the only horror story here is your, if your Wi-Fi stops working on Friday the 13th. Take a look. And now it's time for Vantage Shots images that tell the story. Thailand Prime Minister Petong Tan Shinwa visits flood victims in the country's north. Britain's red arrows soar over the Niagara Falls to mark 100 years of the Canadian Air Force and the first snowball of the season blankets the Swiss Alps. Finally, we're taking you back in history. On this day in 1993, Israel and Palestine signed the first Oslo Accord. It was the first of a pair of agreements signed on the White House lawns. This was the first time Israel and Palestine recognized each each other. The accords were the closest the two sides came to resolving the conflict. We're leaving you on that note. Thank you for watching. Have a great weekend.